Hi. Oh, let's try that one again. Hi. Well, that's probably about as good as it's going to get since I'm in a room by myself and you're all at home. Welcome to Creekside Online. My name is Ken Taylor and I am the teaching pastor here at Creekside. We're really, really excited that we get to do this thing together and I trust that God will bless you. I hope you're strong. I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy and I trust that God will bless our time together today. So this morning what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting a two-part series and it's simply called I've Got Questions About Prayer. I've Got Questions About Prayer fact of the matter is I've got questions about prayer. This is actually my, my, my issue here. I've got questions about prayer. I suspect you have questions about prayer as well. I've got little questions about prayer. I've got more complex questions about prayer and maybe you do too. And if you do, the truth of the matter is that sometimes those questions we have about prayer can impact our our ability to pray the way that we should be, our fervency in terms of prayer. So what we want to do in this series for the next two weeks is really help us understand prayer so that we can be better prayers. You know, it's interesting that one of the most common practices that human beings have is prayer. No matter where you go on the globe, you will find that people pray. It doesn't matter what corner you go to, it doesn't matter what nationality, what ethnicity, it seems like everybody prays. It's just one of those common practices that people get into. I, uh, I remember uh, back on January 26th, I'm sure you do too, 2020, there was a, a helicopter that left from Los Angeles and then on that Sunday morning slammed tragically into some hillside and nine people on board that helicopter were instantly killed. The, um, among the people who were there, they were on their way to a basketball game, they, uh, were gonna be some, there were some couple of coaches and there were some players and there were some parents and so on. And uh, among the nine who died, there were two, one person in particular who was world famous, and his name was Kobe Bryant, and his daughter Gigi, who was 13 at the time, also perished suddenly in that crash. Well, it was interesting to watch a man whose uh, fame sort of reached out into all of the world, uh, the response from that. So Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all kinds of social media, what people were doing was responding to what had happened, and often you found in those responses the word pray or prayer or praying was coming through. And, and, and when you look at the people who were saying this, generally many of them were people who'd maybe never been to a church, never been to a mosque, never been to a synagogue, didn't engage at all in any kind of religious activity, and yet they were leveraging the word pray, praying, and prayer. We're praying for you that the family would, be, would, would, would get past this. We're praying for strength no matter the situation. And it is true that when you think about it, we are a people who are very prone to praying. You know, right now we're going through COVID-19 and all of that pandemic, and a lot of people, I believe, are praying more than they've ever prayed perhaps in their lives. Or if they're regular prayers, they're praying more frequently than they ever have. Something happens to us as human beings. There is this universal piece of us that I believe is drawn towards prayer. I think it's part of the way that God has made us. In fact, it's rather fascinating, this interesting, interesting news here. Um, oh, and one 2004 study found that nearly 30% of atheists admitted that they pray sometimes, and another found that 17% of non-believers in God prayed regularly. Now that's kind of fascinating that people who don't believe in God would actually pray to God, and you're saying, oh, what is, what's that all about? And I suspect that some atheists are not completely convinced about atheism, and it may in fact be that just praying, even if you don't believe it, can be, well, somewhat therapeutic. But the truth of the matter is that we humans are prone to and driven towards praying. Our anthropologists that have found tribes, isolated tribes, have found that they pray too. So this thing called prayer is really a significant player in our lives. And as a result of that, we need to really talk about it. Um, Jesus was very involved in praying. If you look at his life, you'll see that he was someone who prayed frequently. He taught people how to pray. His disciples watched him pray. We have prayers that he gave. The Lord's Prayer is an illustration or an example of that. So the truth of the matter is that prayer becomes very strategic in Jesus' life and ministry. And we look at his followers and we see in scripture how often they prayed. And so the call on us is to do the very same thing. So, I've got questions about prayer. Maybe you've got questions about prayer. What we're going to do in this series is basically look at some questions in prayer. Some you've submitted, some I've come up with. 
Um, many of these questions are questions I've been receiving over the years of being in this role, and I want to just talk about them. This morning we're going to talk about two questions. The first one is going to take us almost the whole time. I want to get this one nailed down. Once we get that one nailed down, then next Sunday we'll look at a whole bunch more questions. But our first question that I think is so important for us to answer is just simply this one. What is prayer? Can you say it with me? What is prayer? What is prayer? I think that's a a great place for us to start. We're gonna spend most of our time trying to understand what prayer is because I believe that a correct understanding of prayer will facilitate a greater passion toward praying, a better effectiveness in praying, and so on. So let me just start with a real simple definition of prayer. Prayer is personal communication with God. Can you say it with me? Prayer is personal communication with God. It's communicating with God and Um, We could unpack this, make this an even bigger definition, but I wanted to start off with just this very simple one. Prayer is simply communicating with God personally. Now, we can do it in groups, but it's still a personal thing when we pray. Now, some people, when they look at all of the various kinds of praying, the various kinds of communication with God, they put them into different categories. So one such category, for example, um, is to put them into five, five different types of praying, and I want to talk about them. One of them is called confession, and that's when you go to God and you admit to sin in your life. You confess an area in which you've failed. The second kind is called petition, and that's when you're going to God and you're saying to God, here is an area, a thing I'd like you to act on. I want you to do this. Will you do this, God? And so it could be prayer about a job or prayer about health or prayer about about, um, relationship stuff and so on. A third category in this grouping would be adoration, and that's when you praise God, you celebrate who God is, you adore him in prayer, you tell him how thankful you are for who he is and what he's done. Then there's intercession. Intercession's a little bit different. Intercession is prayer petitioning for somebody else. So I'm interceding on behalf of someone else, and I'm saying, God, will you do this in that person's life? Will you heal this person? Will you help them at school? Will you help them in a relationship, perhaps, that they're struggling in? And then the fifth kind is called consecration. And consecration prayer is when you're surrendering to God. You're saying, God, I want to give more of myself to you. God, I want to surrender myself to you. So that's one way of thinking about the various kinds of prayer, these five types. Another way is to divide all prayer into three groups. And you could talk about upward prayer, which is prayer that I'm praying to God, I'm celebrating God, I'm adoring God. Outward prayer, when I'm praying about the needs of those outside of my world on a horizontal basis, people's needs, praying for our government, whatever that might be. And then inward prayer, when I'm asking God to deal with my own self. I want to be close to him, I want him to change things in my world. So that's another way of sort of categorizing or dividing up the different types of prayer. Upward prayer, outward prayer, inward prayer. I want to talk about dividing it into two types today. And I want to focus on both of these types of prayer. Um, And again, it's a little dangerous to sort of take prayer because it's such a significant thing and put it into two different categories. But if you'll allow me to do this, I think this can be very helpful for us. So one kind of prayer is called praying to God for involvement. Praying for God in involvement. What we mean by that is we're praying for God to act, to do something, to, to move in a very special way to make something happen. And again, it could be anything from health issues, to praying for God, to provide a job, to finances, to relationship stuff, whatever it may be, it's praying to God for involvement. And the other type is praying to God for intimacy. Praying to God for intimacy is prayer in which you are trying to experience an intimate relationship with God. It's praying for God to be close to you. It's praying for God to know you. It's praying for God to understand you. It's praying for God to be very, very near to you. It's, 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 it's a relational thing between you and God. It's, it's listening to him in scripture, it's responding to who he is, it's inviting him to really draw close to you. So the, this is another way of sort of categorizing prayer, and I really like this two-type model. So let's talk about it. And I wanna begin by talking about praying to God for intimacy. This is the place that I wanna start. And I'll just let it define it this way. Intimacy is what we call the experience of really knowing and being known by another person. Intimacy is that experience of really knowing and being known by someone else. And all of us want someone who we can love and who will love us back again, someone who will be open with us and we can be open with them, 
someone who will care about us and will care about them. We, we want those kinds of experiences. That's something I think happens to every single one of us, even if we're introverts. We want to have some that kind of relationship going on. And when you think about intimacy prayer, what you need to understand is that intimacy prayer, looking at praying and putting it into that category, is dealing specifically with this idea of connecting with God, of being close to God. God wants to be close to us. We are only healthy spiritually, and I would suggest in every other area of our lives, when we're intimate and close with God. This is the starting point here. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful place to be. It's interesting that when Moses writes about God in the book of Deuteronomy, he pens, what other nation, speaking of Israel, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near to us whenever we pray to him? Moses is saying, I look at all the other nations, I look at who they are and what they're all about, and and I would say to them, they don't have what we have, Israel. They don't have a God who's near to them when we pray. For their gods don't really exist. And this is a beautiful thing that God wants us to understand, is he becomes near to us in a very special way when we pray, that you cannot experience any other way. Prayer is unique and special and particularly very, very intimate. It's very intimate. Let me just suggest some reasons that's the case. God is closer to us than anyone else could ever be close to us, right? God is really close to us, closer than anybody else could ever be. And because that potential is there, the opportunity for intimacy is ramped up significantly in light of that truth. You know what it's like when we we talk about personal space? You know what personal space is? Different cultures have different distances for personal space. I think probably as a Canadian, normally we're, when we're not in COVID, 19, which is like six feet, that's our personal space now. But when you think about what we would normally do, personal space is about there. And you've probably had someone from another culture come and talk to you and they move right up here and you're feeling like, you're in my personal space, I don't know if I like that. Well, I wanna tell you where God lives, in your personal space, really close to you. And the truth of the matter is that he's closer than anybody else. Not only is that true, but God knows us like nobody else knows us. Do you understand that? He knows every single secret that you don't want anybody else to know. He is closer to you than anyone. He knows what you're thinking before you know what you're thinking, okay? He knows what you're thinking when you forgot what you're thinking and someone else is asking you, what were you thinking? And you say, I can't remember what I was thinking. He knows what you're thinking. He knows everything about us and it's so beautiful that that's the kind of God that we have. You begin to understand that the the dynamic of intimacy that we have at our hands when we pray. Thirdly, God pursues us like no one else pursues us. God sent Jesus to give his life for us on the cross, to take all our wrongs on himself, to die for us. God so loves us that he died for us. I mean, that's just amazingly true. He, one songwriter said he would rather die than live without us. And, and, and when you understand the pursuing of God toward us that way, it should touch us in very, very deep ways. So here are these truths. He's closer, he knows us, he pursues us. The potential for intimacy with God is at a level like none other. And prayer is a key for us to experience this. So we pray to God for intimacy. We also pray to God for involvement. This is just so critical and so important. Now, one of the things that happens to us, I know it happens to me, and I think it happens to many of us, is our prayers tend to mostly be in this circle. We tend to mostly pray, God, this is what I want you to do, this is what I want you to do, this is what I want you to do, rather than being in this circle. Here's what's really interesting. If you look at the prayers that the Apostle Paul prays for believers in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, every time he writes out a prayer for believers, that prayer is always in the intimacy circle. There isn't a single time when he writes a prayer for anybody that he writes a prayer out in the text of scripture that's for involvement. It's always for intimacy. Now, please understand that I'm not trying to downplay involvement. You'll talk about that in just a minute. But I find it fascinating that when Paul writes the prayers out for us, followers of Jesus in Ephesus and Colossians and so on, that he's asking God to do something on the inside. 
And part of our struggle is that, and I want to put this up here, when we focus on the involvement circle at the expense of the intimacy circle, we struggle with God's response to our prayers and our prayer life becomes anemic and infrequent and boring and formal and distant and dry. Here's what I'm saying. That when our focus is on God do this, God do this, God do this, as good as this is, and you're going to find out in a minute, I'm absolutely convinced we need to do that. He wants us to. At the expense of God be with me, God be with me, God be with me. That it messes up our understanding of God's involvement. When I am intimate with God, when I get close to God, and he says no over here, I am more prone when the intimacy is where it needs to be, to be able to accept that and respond to that. I get to know God more. But when I'm working only on the involvement piece and not on the intimacy piece, I get what I'm suggesting here is anemic, infrequent, boring, formal, distant, and dry. And here's the question I've been asking myself and I'm asking you today, where do most of our prayers go? How much time are we spending in intimacy with God versus the amount of time we're spending in getting God involved in things? And again, I'm not saying no to involvement. You'll hear this in a minute. But I'm challenging us in this area because this may be where we're out of balance. Look at some of Paul's prayers. Watch what he prays for. In my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. What's Paul praying for? Intimacy with God. Here's another passage in Ephesians. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You get what he's saying here? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want you to know this love that God has for you. I want it to touch down in your hearts. That you may be filled with all the measure of the fullness of God. What's he saying? I want you to, be int- I want you to know what it's like to be in an intimate relationship with God. Look at this one from Colossians. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit all the while. You will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Again, you see what he's praying for? He's saying, I want you to be intimate in your relationship with him. I want you to be close to him. That's what I'm praying for. And again, the question I ask myself, I ask us, is this a priority for you? Is this what your prayer life is like? You see, part of the problem, too, with praying more in the involvement circle than in the intimacy circle is that it's very easy for us to believe that if we don't get this thing that we're praying for, that somehow we'll be less satisfied or less fulfilled. And we sometimes take those things we believe that we should have, whatever they may be, and they're not necessarily bad things. It could be job, it could be all those kinds of things. And sometimes we can turn them into idols, where they now become the thing that's going to satisfy us. And we need to make sure that we're pouring our hearts into finding our, our satisfaction with God. What is the ultimate thing, the ultimate one that we can experience in life? Well, of course, it's God, right? Are we experiencing him? Here's an interesting question. But would we ever give a married couple a high score on their marriage if the request of the one to the other when answered would weaken their relationship? And of course, the answer is no. And sometimes God will say no to us because intimacy is something he really wants for us as well. If we really believe that God was everything and having him and having more and more of him was the ultimate experience, would that affect in some manner the content of our prayers? And again, a good question for us to ask ourselves. If I really believe that God is absolutely everything, if I really believe that intimacy with him is the thing that I need most in life, how does that affect my prayers? I think it has a big effect on our prayers. So we've got these two circles, praying to God for intimacy, spent a lot of time on that one, but there's also praying to God for involvement, and you know, and I know, you know, you know, right, this is so important. This is really, really important for us to do as well. And over and over again, scripture talks about this, 
response that we need to have in prayer. We need to go to God and ask him to do things. We need to do that. Jesus did it. Jesus taught us to do it. Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer, and he tells us to ask for things in the Lord's Prayer. In fact, let's look at a number of verses that talk about this. James 4, 2, you do not have because you do not ask God. So ask him. He wants you to ask him. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Ask, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. What he's saying to us is, this is what I want you to do, okay? Look at this one. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who, what's the word? Ask him, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Part of what we should be praying. The Lord taught us to pray pray this way. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You see, again, I want you to ask me to do things. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. This is the elders. Let the elders play over someone, a man or woman who's sick, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. So there is this clear declaration in Scripture that God wants us to ask things from him. He says that. That's just so important for us to do that. And so, as we think about God and the intimacy that we have with God, and then we realize his call on us to ask for things, we realize that we can ask anything from him because he knows everything about us, and he wants us to express that to him as a father would to a child. So you can ask God anything. You can ask God to help you with your relationships. You can ask God to help you with your finances, with your marriage, with your sexual life. You can ask God to help you with, with um, your job search, your schooling, and it can go on and on and on because God wants us to do that. Right now, some of us are struggling with COVID-19 and the whole pandemic. And God understands and God knows and when you're close to him, you need to understand that he, he knows this. He knows this all about you. And you should be sort of caught up in the wonder that, he's, that he knows what I'm going through. At the very same time, I can ask him anything. Some of us are very afraid right now. And we need to know that God understands that. And we need to go to him and say, God, I'm afraid. Can you help me? Some of us have, um, because of what's happened economically and with our jobs, we have a lot of time on our hands and what would be really good for us to go and say, God, can you help me with this extra time I have? Help me to, 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 to use it wisely. Help me to be strong and healthy because of it. Some of us are in the opposite situation where maybe we're in the medical field or in some other area and we are going crazy with how busy we are and how difficult it is. And what God would say to us is, come and talk to me. I want to help you. Some of us are alone at home, single mom, single parent, and you've got those kids there and It's just so different than what you were used to. And I want to tell you that God understands and he wants you to go and he wants you to talk to him. Some of us are feeling financial pressure because we've lost our jobs, we got laid off or something else has happened and it's just tough right now and you need to go to God and talk to him. Some of our marriages maybe, the tension in the home, this is just not normal, we haven't been this way before and it may be difficult. Maybe you got friends that you need to see and you aren't seeing them like you'd like to see them and this is really important that you do that. So there's all these areas and God would say, I want you to just come to me and I want you to pray to me. I want you to ask me. I'm here for you. That's so important for us to understand. So what is prayer? We spent most of our time talking about that. Now here is a second question and next Sunday I've got a whole bunch more questions. But Here's a second question that I get asked actually quite frequently. And it's this question, is there a proper posture for prayer? Is there a proper posture for prayer? In other words, is is kneeling better than standing? Is bowing better than keeping my head straight up? Should I look up? Can I pray with my eyes open? Um, All of those questions people will ask me. And I know I went through periods in my life where I felt, okay, if I do this with my body, that's going to make the prayer much more effective. God's got to listen to me, you know? I don't know if you've been through that at all. But the bottom line answer is, eh. Not so much. And in fact, if you look in Scripture, it's interesting all the different options or postures for prayer that are found in Scripture. Here's some of them. Standing, lifting up hands, sitting, kneeling, looking upward, bowing down, placing the head between the knees. I've never done that one. Pounding the breast. I don't think I've done that either. Or praying toward the temple. Never done that one either. But you can see that there are a lot of these different options about praying. 
Um, it's not about the posture of your body, it's all about the posture of your heart. Can you say that with me, please? It's not about the posture of your body, it's all about the posture of your heart. And this is so critical and so important. So I can pray driving my car with my eyes open. That's an okay thing to do. I had a friend who would go to the, to the, to the uh, pool every uh, a couple of three days a week, and he had a list of people that he would pray for while he was swimming. That was his time to pray particularly for his family, and he would just simply do that as he was swimming. That was really important to him. It doesn't matter about our posture. So whatever, your po- whatever you feel comfortable with, that's one way of doing it. It also may be true that if you're used to praying standing all the time, maybe you should try sitting. If you're used to sitting, maybe you should try kneeling. If you're used to, used to having your eyes closed, maybe you should have your eyes open. That maybe you should try a different posture because sometimes a different posture can help you connect a little bit more and be more engaged in that prayer. Um, and I, so I would urge you to try that. In fact, here's something that I've tried lately um, that um, one of my favorite writers and preachers by the name of John Ortberg has suggested. And it was really, I remember listening to him and thinking about it and thinking, no, I can't do that. And then I was uh, sitting at a Williams with a, with a friend and um, I wanted to pray for him. And so I said, I'd like to try something really new. Are you okay? Let me, let me tell you what it is. And then we're, we're going to pray this way if, if you're okay with it. I said, what I want to do is I want to pray with my eyes open and I want you to have your eyes open and I want to look into your eyes while I'm praying this. And it was just a radically different experience for me. I'd never been through that before. But that new kind of posture, it made it, made it very, very special to both him and me. And so I, I think it's important for us to understand, right? That it's, it's not about the posture of your body, but it's, it's all about the posture of your heart. But sometimes the posture of our bodies can help us with the posture of our hearts. But never, don't pick it the other way around. That's just so important. So. We've been talking about prayer. We've tried to answer a couple of questions. The bottom line, however, I guess is this one. Are you praying? Because my dream, my longing, my passion for our time together in this series is for this to go up and to the right, for you to be a more intimate, more involved prayer than you have ever been before, and for you and I to both discover in deeper and richer ways what it means to talk to the creator, the sovereign creator of the universe, and know that he hears us and responds to our prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you're hearing my voice, that you're listening to me, even though millions may be praying at the very same time. This is an intimate conversation between you and me, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that you know me like no one else knows me, that you love me like nobody else loves me, and that you long to be so close to me 